Robert is going to be coming out a little later to give their remarks. Um, I am Boris Hussain. I'm the South Asia Policy Analyst for the U.S. Commission on International Rights Freedom, and I wanted to thank the Land Use Human Rights Commission for hosting this discussion on issues confronting the Ahmadiyya community around the world. As one of the most persecuted subgroups in the Islamic world, the Ahmadiyya community faces multifaceted challenges and threats that our panelists today will explain in the context of Pakistan, Algeria, and from a global perspective. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists. We'll speak for about five minutes each, and then we'll open it up for questions as well. Um, you can find their biographies for the speakers outside on the table. Um, but to just give a general overview of everyone, uh, Mahmoud Ahmed, who's sitting at the far left, is the Deputy Director of Public Affairs for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA and the General Secretary for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association USA. Um, seated next to me, Farhanad Isfahani, is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a senior fellow for South and Southeast Asia at the Religious Freedom Institute in Washington, D.C. In the middle is Eric Goldstein, who is Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division. Um, to begin, uh, we're going to go ahead and shift over to Mamou, who's going to give us a sort of global perspective on the Amadea community and perhaps some of the challenges they face. Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Barr said, my name is uh, Mahmoud Ahmad. I'm the uh, Deputy National uh, Director of Public Affairs for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community here in the United States and also serve as the uh, General Secretary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association here in the United States. Um, I want to thank the distinguished co-chairs of this esteemed commission for the privilege of uh, appearing before them today and to also recognize the uh, co-chairs of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Caucus uh, for their support in organizing this important um, I've been asked today to provide sort of a thumbnail sketch of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and the uh, persecution that it faces worldwide, uh, which is a topic, of course, of great concern to our community. Uh, before I sort of delve into that, let me give a brief introduction of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for those of you who may not have it. Um, the community was founded in 1889, so more than 125 years ago, and it is a revivalist movement within Islam. Um, Ahmadi Muslims profess to be Muslim in every respect of that word, which is an important uh, component of the persecution that they face. And a central tenet of their Islamic faith is that we reject terrorism um, for any and all reasons. And that has been part of our DNA from the very day that our founder, Hadith Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, established the community in Qadiyan, which was then part of British India. Today, our community is established in more than 200 countries, and its tens of millions of adherents follow the only spiritual caliph of the Muslim world, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masoor Ahmed, who resides in London. And the community is the largest organized Muslim community with a single leader in the world. Now, turning to the topic of the persecution of Ahmadi Muslims, let me begin by saying that from the very beginning, religious extremists who subscribed to a violent ideology of armed jihad opposed this new community that rejected any violence in the name of religion. So that was true even in the late 19th century in India, is that those forces of extremism who wanted to advance a worldview in which different religions would be pinned against each other, um, and, and there would be violent struggle between religions and among adherents of a particular religion, saw this new teaching of peace coexistence is a threat to the kind of world they wanted to advance. And if you then follow the story of radicalization around the Muslim world, something that has obviously come into stark relief for the audience here in the United States ever since the uh, awful attacks on September 11, 2001, you will see that the story of radicalization in the Muslim world and the persecution of Ahmadi Muslims is really of one piece. And so, Sadly, today, if you look around the Muslim world, Ahmadi Muslims face persecution in virtually every part. And in virtually every part of the Muslim world, Ahmadi Muslims were at the forefront of establishing peaceful uh, countries with a secular worldview. Um, for example, in Baksta, which uh, Farhanaz will touch on um, in, in, a, in a few minutes, um, Ahmadi Muslims were instrumental in the creation of Pakistan. 
Uh, and the Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, relied on Ahmadi Muslims as, as an essential part of the coalition that he had to advance his worldview of a pluralistic, inclusive version of Pakistan. And its first foreign minister, Muhammad Zafurullah Khan, was a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and advocated for those very values. Sadly, since then, as you will hear, things have deteriorated massively. And the very community that was instrumental in creating the country and advancing a pluralistic vision for the country is now subjected to persecution, not only at the hands of religious extremists and, and, and terrorists, but also at the hands of the state, which is now largely captive to those forces. And that story does not end in Pakistan. It carries across the world. Um, for example, in Indonesia, uh, arguably one of the most populous countries of Muslims in the world. Again, Ahmadi Muslims have been there since the 1920s. They are um, a tremendously positive force for good in that country. And yet today, Indonesia, supposedly a moderate Muslim country, discriminates uh, rampantly against Ahmadi Muslims, among other minorities, of course, Christians and, and, and others. Um, and Ahmadi Muslims have been brutally murdered. Their mosques have been destroyed. The community is essentially proscribed. Um, you know, Turning to places like the Middle East and North Africa, uh, conditions for Ahmadi Muslims are, if anything, even more precarious. Although their numbers are smaller, and therefore the, the, the sheer number of acts of persecution may be smaller for that reason, uh, they are forced to live underground. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, Ahmadi Muslims are not even allowed to step inside the country, let alone have any kind of established existence. Similarly, in countries around the Middle East, the community to the extent exists, it exists very quietly uh, without a lot of public footprint uh, and, and really cannot function in a meaningful way. And Eric, of course, will speak to particularly the conditions in Algeria that have emerged in recent years as a topic of particular concern. Um, you know, even in countries that were established uh, post-1989 in the post-Soviet era, um, even though they were operating on what one would say is a blank slate, even in those countries, Ahmadi Muslims are facing a lot of discrimination and hurdles. For example, uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, two of the former Soviet republics, Central Asian countries, um, there are restrictions now on uh, any religious group uh, being established, uh, but in particular, any kind of Muslim group that is outside the, the, uh, the, the, the narrowly proscribed mainstream state-run Islamic worldview is looked on with a lot of uh, suspicion, and our community, though we have fulfilled all the requirements legally for registering in those countries, has faced tremendous difficulty in getting established, has repeatedly been, been, been at the losing end of court decisions and interventions by state state security forces. And so, um, and if you take this then to the highest level, at the level of the Organization for Islamic Countries, at the OIC level, you will see these same issues playing out. Uh, resolutions have been passed at the OIC calling for um, Ahmadis to be the subject of, of discrimination, calling for Ahmadis to be declared non-Muslim. And so this is not an isolated series of events. It is really, as I said at the beginning, uh, the work of the same ideolo ideological forces that are driving extremism around the Muslim world, often with state intervention uh, at their behest, uh, really trying to trample down on this country. And so it is a microcosm of the types of issues uh, that are being faced by the Muslim world today. I think I'll stop with that global introduction and uh, uh, hopefully that uh, our panelists can, can uh, expound on this a bit in terms of the specific countries that we have. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mahmoud. That was um, a really great, I think, global perspective for us to get sort of an overview of the issues that are facing the Ahmadi community. So now let's turn to one of the countries you mentioned um, Pakistan, and I'll turn it over to uh, Fernando Sahani to take over for discussing the end of the issues in Pakistan. Thank you, so, um, thank you so much to the Tom Lantos Commission on Human Rights for inviting me here to speak about um, one of Pakistan's most oppressed groups, the Ahmadi Muslims. Um, I have written a book about Pakistan's religious minorities, all of them, Muslim and non-Muslim. And we are today going to speak about Ahmadi Muslims in the light of Pakistan. Bef 
Before I get to all the details of what has happened to the Anglobies today, I want to just quickly talk about how did Pakistan get to this point. Most of the prejudice against religious minorities in Pakistan can be traced to the effort by Islamist radicals, both intellectual and physical radicals, to make Pakistan purer as to what they conceive to be an Islamic state. Pakistan's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had advanced the case for a secular, albeit Muslim-majority Pakistan. <clears throat> In all except the first phase of Pakistan's birth, the Ahmadiyya or Ahmadi community has often been a major target of bigotry. After the partition era violence, the first major religious rights in Pakistan targeted the Ahmadi community in 1953. Why is Pakistan important and why am I speaking to you about it out of all the countries where Ahmadis may live? Well, Pakistan is home to the largest Ahmadi community in the world and it is the first country to constitutionally and legally discriminate against Ahmadis. Pakistan is therefore the center of anti Ahmadiyya prejudice and violence which has now unfortunately spread to other Muslim-majority countries, which my colleague will get to in a little while. Today, the total population of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan is 207 million. It is 96% Muslim, with Ahmadis comprising around 0.22% of the population, which is around 4 to 5 million people. So you would think with such a small minority, why are so many Pakistani Muslims, Sunni groups and in some cases even Shia groups, trying so hard to oppress the Ahmadi in every way? Why? They're so small in numbers. Well, to go back to it, Pakistan today is considered one of the worst violators of religious freedom in the entire world. So it's a microcosm of all the human rights and religious freedom issues you see elsewhere. At the time of partition in 1947, almost 23% of Pakistan's population, which then included Bangladesh, comprised of non-Muslim citizens, so almost a quarter of Pakistan's population was non-Muslim. Today, the proportion of non-Muslims has fallen to approximately 3%. So how did this happen? Well, part of it, it started with the Ahmadi community, who were declared non-Muslim by the writ of the state in 1974 through a constitutional amendment. So a community that had always considered itself Muslim was deemed non-Muslim through the constitution and laws and today are therefore pariahs because they consider themselves belonging to the Muslim community. But the Muslim community violently and non-violently does everything in its possibility, including the state, to persecute the enemies. And the Ahmed community in Pakistan, now these are a few things I think you should take away with you, are forbidden by law from describing themselves as Muslims, from using the term mosque for their places of worship, from publicly calling the azan before prayers. They risk a stiff jail sentence for violating ordinances that forbid them from any act that might identify themselves as followers of Islam. In January of this year, a student in Pakistan shot his high school prin principal dead after being reprimanded for skipping school to attend a sit-in organized by one of Pakistan's Islamist extremist parties. The killer, the student, argued that the principal had committed blasphemy by questioning the right of the student to attend the sit-in, which was condemning blasphemy. 
The sit-in had been organized by the Tariqe Labed Ya Rasulullah, or the movement for the call of Allah's Prophet, only the latest addition to Pakistan's pantheon of extremist groups. Instead of enforcing the law against a small number of TLYR extremist protesters, the civilian government of Pakistan was forced to accept their demands. With the country's army chief acting as negotiator, a truce was signed between the government and the extremist leader. Witnesses spotted military officers giving money to some of the protesters, raising suspicion that the protests had been engineered to further undermine the authority of the civilians. What was one of the major demands of these extremists? who both the civilian government and the military chief gave a free pass. One of their main demands was Pakistan and these citizens not be allowed to vote alongside the majority Muslim population. Now you strip them off their religion officially. You have taken away almost all their rights. You have made them almost non-citizens in every way. And now when you have these extremists demanding they not be allowed to vote alongside Pakistani Muslims, the army chief shows up himself, brokers a deal with these extremists, the civilian government of Pakistan comes in also and makes a deal with the extremists. So what does that tell you about Pakistan? It's from the top down and the bottom up. And that's how you know you have a society that is very, very dangerous for Ahmadis and um, all really people of religious minorities. Um, welcome to everyone. I'm sorry, I, I was in the middle of shall I? Ahmadis already bear the brunt of Pakistan's repressive laws and the widespread antipathy towards religious minorities in Pakistan society. They are effectively disenfranchised and constantly targeted for repression. In March of this year, the Islamabad High Court ruled that all citizens must declare their religion when applying for identity documents and re-emphasize the need for a declaration that set Ahmadis apart from Muslims. Once again, now you've deemed them non-Muslim, you've taken away your rights, but in March of this year, you have the Islamabad High Court once again stressing this point. According to the judgment of the court, citizens who disguise their religious affiliation were guilty of betraying the state, treason, and that the government of Pakistan shall take special measure ensuring availability of correct particulars of all the citizens, and it should not be possible for any citizen to hide his or her identity and recognition. The Human Rights Watch representative in Pakistan pointed out that the judge was, I'm quoting, not only attacking everyone's religious freedom in Pakistan, but he's also focusing on one particular set, which is the Ahmadis. Prejudice against Ahmadis has only increased over the last few years, and Justice Siddiqui's judgment, as well as the Army Chief's indirect support for TLYR shows how the Pakistani state endorses the prejudice. The beginning of the holy month of Ramadan this year was marked by extremist Sunni Muslims in the town of Sialkot, destroying a hundred-year-old Ahmadi mosque. They were led by a local politician belonging to the Tehrik Islam Insaf party, a cricketer turned politician Imran Khan, who is hoping to be the next Prime Minister of Pakistan. And Mr. Khan and his supporters had often publicly spoken about the fact that Ahmadis are not Muslims, and in disparaging ways about other religious minorities in Pakistan, like Hindus and like Christians. Since the passage of the anti ahmadi Ordinance 20 by General Zia in 1984, more than 264 Ahmadis have been killed for their faith. 182 of these happened in Punjab province. Since Ahmadis were declared to be non-Muslim, 
27 of their mosques have been demolished, 33 sealed, 21 set on fire, 17 forcibly occupied, and authorities prevented the construction of 17 Ahmadi mosques. The injustice and blatant disregard for international norms in treating a person from a religious minority is exemplified in the case of Mr. Abdul Shakur, an optician who was 80 years old at the time he was arrested in 2015 for merely possessing Ahmadi religious literature. Mr. Shakur was charged with propagating the Ahmadiyya faith, a crime under the Pakistani Penal Code, and stirring up religious hatred and sectarianism, a crime under the 1997 Anti-Terrorism Act. Today, he is 82 years old and remains in prison for nothing more than keeping books pertaining to his religion at his own workplace. I will stop here so we can move forward, but in the question and answers, if anyone has anything specific, I'd be ready to answer. Thank you, Farnaz. Um, and we've been joined by representatives here in the government. I wanted to turn the floor over to you all because you have very busy schedules. And we'll get back to Eric. Sorry about this. Um, but I'll turn the floor over to you all if you want to make some comments. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased to be here with our distinguished panelists and those of you in the audience. Um, uh, to, and thank you for coming to our briefing on the uh, human rights and religious freedom issues facing the Amadeya Muslim community. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Jackie Spear, a fellow member of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and uh, co-chair of the Congressional Amadeya Muslim Caucus. Um, uh, and our thanks to the caucus for co-hosting today's event. Um, and I want to express my appreciation to my constituents who have kept me informed about uh, the discrimination uh, that uh, Amadeya Muslims face uh, all over the world. And the Amadeya Muslim movement originated in northern India in the late 19th century. Its founder, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, saw himself as a renewer of Islam chosen by Allah. Ahmadiyya Islam stresses nonviolence, religious toleration, and it places a high priority on the building of mosques, schools, and hospitals. Unfortunately, some Muslims view Ahmadiyya Islam as heretical because it recognizes a prophet following Muhammad. This has led to persecution and discrimination against Ahmadiyya Muslims worldwide. In Pakistan, a 1974 constitutional amendment declared Ahmadis non-Muslims. A decade later, new laws banned Ahmadis from identifying themselves as Muslims, calling their places of worship mosques, and propagating their faith in any way, directly or indirectly. Uh, they are barred from reciting the Quran or using traditional Islamic readings. Ahmadis in Pakistan are, are also some of the most common defendants in criminal charges of blasphemy, which can carry the death penalty. They have been targeted under Pakistan's anti-terrorism laws. Attacks committed against them by mobs and militant groups take place with impunity. And I want to mention one man in particular who's been a victim of this legal discrimination. Uh, Abdul Shakur is an 80-year-old bookseller from the city of Rabwa, where many Ahmadis reside. In 2015, police raided Abdul's shop, arrested him, and accused him of selling an Ahmadiyya commentary on the Quran, among other publications. Authorities charged him with printing, publishing, and disseminating any material to incite hatred and insulting religion. He's serving a combined eight years in prison on these charges. Abdul